It is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Julian Richard Albert. Julian undertook his bachelor's degree at Concordia University in Montreal before moving to Vancouver to conduct his PhD with Matthew Lawrence. Um, they are studying allele-specific DNA methylation dynamics and early mouse development. It was during his PhD that I had the good fortune to meet Julian as we were PhD students in neighboring labs. We spent many hours together doing analysis in the shared bioinformatics office. Following his PhD, Julian moved to France for his postdoctoral work in the lab of Maxine Greenberg, where he uh, really has hit the ground running. He has two preprints out this fall, and I'll try and post the links to those um, in the chat so you can go and read those at your leisure. Um, and I could go on about Julian, but I'll just say he's an incredibly kind, creative, and talented scientist, and I'm very excited today to hear about his postdoctoral work. So please join me in giving a warm, albeit virtual, welcome to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Julian Richard Albert. Oh, thanks a lot, Ben, for the really kind introduction. I really enjoyed our time together in the shared bioinformatics office where I really uh, cut my teeth on bioinformatics. So hello, everyone. As Ben mentioned, I do mammalian epigenetics, and my research generally focuses on how cells turn genes on and off during mouse development, for example. Um, so here, for example, we're looking at one specific gene. It's called ZDBF2. It encodes a zinc finger protein. We're not really sure what it does, but we know it's expressed primarily in the adult brain in mouse and human. I really like this gene because if you force the mouse to not express the gene, you get a small uh, skinny mouse compared to its normal brother and sister. And if you force the overexpression of the gene, you get a long and fat mouse. So this is a real nice example of how the transcriptional control of a single gene can have these entire body effects throughout the entire life of a mouse. So the question we're trying to answer is, how do cells modulate these gene expression levels? And in Max Greenberg's lab, where I'm a postdoc, we're interested in the unconventional roles DNA methylation has to play on gene regulation. So what is DNA methylation? It's an epigenetic modification first proposed about 50 years ago now that enables cells to differentially mark their DNA without changing the underlying sequence. And that would enable, for example, a multicellular organism to have many different cell types that express different sets of genes. So yeah, this was proposed a while ago and they were pretty spot on with their theory. So we now know which enzymes, DNA methyltransferase 3 A and B, deposit DNA methylation de novo on unmarked DNA. Following replication, uh, DNA polymerase doesn't care about methylcytosine, so it doesn't propagate the mark, but there's a maintenance enzyme, DNMT1, that recognizes this pattern of DNA methylation, fills in the mark, allowing it to be propagated through cell cycles. Um, what I will note here is that in mammals, which is what our research is interested in, DNA methylation occurs primarily at CPG dinucleotides. So it's CPG on the forward strand and CPG on the reverse strand. And we know that the CPG methylation is really important because if you knock out in these genes, the embryo dies, and that's associated with this massive dysregulation of gene expression. Um, so I mentioned DNA methylation doesn't change the underlying sequence. However, over evolutionary time, it kind of does. So here I'm showing the chemical structure of cytosine and 5-methylcytosine. So when I say DNA methylation, I mean 5-methylcytosine. And for whatever reason in nature, spontaneous deamination is pretty common. And if you're unmethylated, deamination results in a uracil. And that's easily recognized as a non-canonical DNA base, and it's quickly repaired by machinery, back to cytosine. However, if you're methylated, this results, deamination results in thymine, and that's more difficult to repair. So as a consequence, mammals who have really dense or high methylation levels at CPGs have this slow erosion of CPG in, in sequence over time. So normally you would expect it to have a one come up one in every 16 dinucleotides. However, we observe CPGs only one every about 100. Except, and biology is always interesting because of the exceptions, over what we call CPG islands. So what are CPG islands? Here we're looking at one. So this is a genome browser screenshot. I'm going to show a lot of them during this presentation, so that I'll just get familiar with it. The important bit is here, where each time 
there's a CPG in the genome. This, in this case, it's a, we're looking at a mouse gene. Each time a CPG island comes up, I put a tick. And you can appreciate that there's really a high variation in CPG density at this gene. This gene is encoded from, it's transcribed from left to right. Um, and so the thick dark boxes are exons and what link them are the introns. And what we notice with these, our mammalian genome sequences is that these CPG islands, so-called CPG islands, because they're in an otherwise CPG depleted ocean of sequence, these overlap promoters. And so one of the theories is despite the erosion of CPG sequences, these CPG islands are really important regulatory sequences. And so there's selective pressure to keep the sequence. Okay. And it's specifically the DNA methylation of these dense CPG islands that's associated with transcriptional repression. So here we're looking at two different cell states, one I call hypomethylated and the other hypermethylated. So each bar is a CPG and the height of that bar corresponds to the percent methylation of that CPG. And so this is the same gene we were looking at earlier with its CPG island promoter. And you can see in one cell type, it's hypomethylated and the other is hypermethylated. If we superimpose RNA-seq data, you can see that this gene is only transcribed in the cell type where its promoter is not methylated. So this is really the canonical role of DNA methylation in silencing transcription. Okay. Is that all I have to say? Yeah. And there's a second repressive epigenetic mark that I don't have time to introduce, but long story short, histones over which DNA, meth DNA is wound and you get nucleosomes, his the histone tails can also be methylated. And if you methylate specifically lysine 27 with three methyl groups, that also confers gene repression. So here's an example of what K27 trimethylation looks like on a genome browser. You don't get single nucleotide levels, uh, single nucleotide resolution anymore, because now you're pulling down DNA that's wound around nucleosomes. So you get these more mountain patterns of enrichment. And what I want to point out in this screenshot is that in the hypomethylated cells, where you don't really have DNA methylation, K27 tri is broadly established. So from this side of my mouse all the way to here, this is what I and others call a K27 tri domain. But then in the hypermethylated cell state, this domain is restricted. And, it's, and the K27 tri is restricted to its canonical targets, which are generally CPG islands. And importantly for transcription, if you're K27 tri marked, the repression is maintained. So in mammals, this is the background. These are two different epigenetic pathways to silence transcription. So I was kind of showing these abstract cell types, but these are in fact derived from real real um, cells. So the hypomethylated cell state are inner cell mast cells of the blastocyst. And during this short transition, during post-implantation embryogenesis, there's a big wave of de novo DNA methylation deposition that gives rise to the epiblast embryo. And what's really neat is that this epiblast embryo further divides and differentiates into all the different cell types of the adult organism. So we're really interested in this part of development because any, anything that can go wrong, any insult to the system can potentially give rise to whole body and lifelong effects because it's inherited in this epiblast. This is concomitant with broad K27 tri in the blastocyst being then restricted to CPG islands in the epiblast. And we really are interested in this in this transition. However, it's hard to study because if you knock out the DNA methyltransferases, as I said before, uh, that's it. You you fail to develop beyond a stage much farther than this, so you die. So it's hard to study. So one thing that my current supervisor Max Greenberg did when he was a postdoc with Deborah Borkis is he allowed the genome-wide deposition of DNA methylation to occur but he prevented it at one specific region. And it's at this sort of nothing region upstream the ZDBF2 gene, which I'll call it epimutation. So these, these mice that they made have the de novo, have, are hypermethylated, except for this one region. And when they compare them to their wild type brothers and sisters, you can see that they're much smaller. And he, associate, he was able to associate this with a failure to activate ZDBF2, which is a counterintuitive result since DNA methylation is normally associated with 
transcriptional repression. In this case, they're preventing the deposition of DNA methylation, and this is preventing the activation of ZDBF2. And he was able to show that this is due to the aberrant maintenance of K27 tri at this upstream region of ZDBF2. That's normally very broad in the blastocyst and gets restricted due to DNA methylation. Without the DNA methylation, it's able to remain broad and extend over the CPG island promoter of the gene, which we think is what's making it repressed. So this is this is like one of the reasons I joined the lab. It's a super nice great vocabulary um, experiment that shows that it's really the programming within this short window of ebryogenesis that's programming the later expression of this gene in the postnatal mouse. However, it's the only known example. So my job when I come in was to find more examples. And luckily, we don't have to do this in vivo. So very quickly, these stages are we're able to model them in vitro. So embryo, embryonic stem cells from the blastocyst. We can then differentiate into epiblast-like cells that mirror the epiblast. And you can see they also get uh, genome-wide global DNA methylation gain. And what's nice is that these embryonic stem cells, we can knock out the DNMTs, the de novo methyltransferases, and also differentiate them. So we can generate epiblast-like cells that lack DNA methylation. So what Anna, the other postdoc in the lab, did was she profiled these four cell types for all these different epigenome uh, marks, epigenetic marks. So K27 tri DNA methylation and gene expression. I'm not talking about it today, but we also did a 3D confirmation study. That's uh, recently went out as a preprint. The first thing we want to check was whether this antagonism between DNA methylation and K27 tri was true genome-wide or if it's only happening at ZDBF2. So what I did was we chopped up the genome into 10 kb bins and measured the enrichment of K27 tri levels over those 10 kb bins. And so those are individual data points. And here I'm plotting the enrichment level in wild-type hypermethylated epiblast-like cells and epiblast-like cells that completely lack DNA methylation because we genetically knocked out the DNA methyl transferases. And what you can see is there's this big population of 10 kb bins that have high K27 tri methylation levels. And if you if I color the data points based on their DNA methylation levels in wild type cells, we can see that it's really the 10 kb bins that would have otherwise gained DNA methylation that are now apparently maintaining K27 tri. And as a proof of principle, the ZDBF2 upstream gene that Max found as a kind of single locus experiment is somewhere in this blob of, of 10 kb bins. So this is pretty strong evidence that the two pathways are antagonistic. And what we really cared about was whether any underlying genes are being affected. So through some computational magic that I don't have time to go over, no one really cares about anyway, I found 70 to about 100 genes depending on my uh, thresholding parameters, that behave exactly like ZDBF2. So here's ZDBF2, where it goes from, it gains high levels of DNA methylation upstream, its CPG island promoter. And this is associated with kicking off K27 tri only in the wild type epiblast-like cells. So in the TKO, that would have otherwise gained DNA methylation, but can't because we knocked out the DNA methyltransferases, these maintain K27 tri, and that's associated with the, main, the, with the maintained repression of the gene. So it's only in the wild-type cells that gain DNA methylation where the gene is able to be activated. And here's another example of one of the 70 Canada genes, Celsor 2. It's my new favorite gene. Well, long story short, it behaves just like ZWF2. It's pretty interesting um, because both these genes are expressed in the brain normally. However, that's not true for all of these candidate genes. So it's not like there's a shared uh, expression pattern of these genes. Um, so really the main conclusion of this talk is that it seems like these two repressive mechanisms are kind of coming in at a, at a very small portion of loci and seem to cancel each other out, allowing for the future expression of the gene. However, in these assays, we're saying that it's methylation at these highlighted regions that's kicking off K27 tri. However, we're really differentiating these and DNA methylation is being de deposited everywhere in the genome. So in order to really say that it's DNA methylation at these specific regions, Anna 
set up these epigenome editing experiments, which were later finished by Teresa, a PhD student lab. And long story short, you take normal embryonic stem cells wild type and you target the DNA methylation deposition machinery at the region of interest using a catalytically inactive Cas9 and the, and the CRISPR-Cas9 pathway. Um, unfortunately, Teresa tested this and it really only worked for one out of 24 guide RNAs. And coincidentally, it happened to be at the ZDBF2 locus. So you can see here in control cells and in epigenome edited cells, you get about a 20% gain in DNA methylation. So a pessimistic view of this is that it's really not that easy to establish DNA methylation in ESCs. Optimist, it actually worked at one. So what happened to polycomb and gene expression? So here's our gain in DNA methylation, which seemed to be sufficient to decrease the levels of K27 tri over the, over the region. However, this was not sufficient to enable the activation of the gene, as we would have hypothesized. Um, we've done some follow-up studies, and we think we know why, um, but I don't have time to get into it today. Since this was so difficult to, to, to put DNA methylation on in hypomethylated cells, we wondered whether the converse was true. Is it Can we take off DNA methylation? So Teresa differentiated the cells into hypermethyl epiblast-like cells and removed DNA methylation specifically at our regions of interest. And this worked a lot better. So here's ZDBF2. These are the control cells. The region's hypermethylated. You introduce the DNA methylation erasure enzymes at a specific region. And now we have low methylation levels. This is correlated with the maintenance of K27 tri over the region and the failure to activate the gene similar to similar levels as the TKO cells. And this also worked for our favorite candidate gene, Celser 2 So you can see we remove the DNA methylation, polycomb is maintained, the gene fails to activate. So this is like a really nice combo of elegant epigenome editing experiments to show that it's really DNA methylation levels at those specific regions that's modulating gene expression in a counterintuitive gene activating way. So that is it. What I've said so far is available as a preprint. I will note that many have noticed that in human cancers, DNA methylation and K27 tri are really globally dysregulated, and it seems to be at the expense of one another. So now we're wondering whether this form of regulation that's happening in mouse embryogenesis may also be occurring in human cancers. And finally, as I alluded to, Anna did 3D confirmation experiments. So in another preprint we put up last week, we show that DNA methylation not only antagonizes K27 tri, but also antagonizes some 3D looping. So that's very interesting. And go check it out. So with that, I'd like to thank the Greenberg Lab, Max for his mentoring, Anna for doing pretty much all the wet lab experiments, and Teresa for all of the epigenome editing experiments. And thank you for your time. Happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Julian. That was fantastic. Um, we have, mm -hmm. I'll remind people you can post your questions in the Q&A or raise your hand and I'll unmute you to ask the question yourself. I'll maybe just start this off. Julian, I know the the zinc the ZBDF2 is an imprinted, imprinted gene. How many of your other ones are imprinting? Like, is, is there much crossover there? It's, it's of the 70 to 100, it's the only imprinted gene that we found. So the crossover is just ZBF2. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, and then it looks like Rob has his hand raised. So maybe we'll, Rob, you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, that was a lovely talk, Julian. Really nice and clear, lovely data. Um, so the thing that struck me was obviously when you have genome-wide methylation, the conspicuous uh, absence is usually at the CPG islands. And you found this subset um, that seemed, at least in the examples you showed, to be upstream. So is that generally the case that they're not the ones that sit directly on the transcription start site? And are they also those ones which have a somewhat intermediate CPG density? So these are not your big strong king active beta CPG islands, but an intermediate class. And if that is the case, are they similar to the ones that Dirk Schubler looked at back in the sort of 2010-ish point where there was this sort of intermediate category where all the variable methylation was going on? Yeah, so that's uh, that, that's very astute observation there. Yeah, we think that's exactly what's happening. So 
we have some of these candidate regions that are with that aren't upstream that are within the gene body but we think that what's happening is for some other trans uh, reason the gene is not expressed and that allows polycom to come in so we think that that's so we kind of like uh, filter those out we're really interested in the ones that are upstream many of many are like and there's lots of those and yes they definitely overlap these CPG intermediate regions. Um, so yeah, so I have I have this kind of neat plot here, which is CPG density. It kind of looks like a chipseq track. Um, and you can see this K27 tri peak at ZDBF2. It's not peaking at the CPG island promoter or its upstream CPG island. It's really in between the two where you have this intermediate CPG density. Um, we think that this has an important like gen underlying genetic role in why these two mechanisms are kind of competing. Um, and it would have been nice to show that they overlap with uh, Dirk Schubler and Michael Weber's list of intermediate CVG density promoters. However, they focused really on the transcription start site, whereas we're uh, kind of giving some breathing room and looking upstream. Um, but they're intermediate I guess in my definition of intermediate CPG, yeah. Great, great. Okay. And then we, uh, I've asked uh, Yatindra this is the next question. You should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Julian. Um, amazing talk. Um, I I'm referring to the experiment where you um, use dead Cas9 uh, fused to TET enzymes. To so can we go back to that slide? Sure. Yeah, so what I'm referring to is that uh, you expect that the promoter would, uh, because you are seeing loss of K20S3, um, K27 K trimethyl, but you don't. In in our in our epigenome editing cells, we see the aberrant maintenance of K27 tri. Yeah, yeah. If you go to the to the right, just right of this. Oh, uh, yeah. Dead dbf2 expression so when you are uh, what we have seen is that when when we use dead gas 9 uh, in in to a promoter it, it kind of puts some amount of repression on the promoter by itself yes yeah so that's something so here are so control that, oh sorry sorry you sorry, cut out on itself is affecting because you you are not expecting a huge increase in promoter activity and whatever you are expecting might be shielded by the dead cast. If, I'm sorry if I missed the control. Oh, no, for sure. I, I didn't have time to go over it. So, and that's a very excellent point. And we're, in fact, repeating the controls for this exact reason, for the exact uh, concern you brought up. So here, our control was simply not targeting the system to the locus. But the better control is to target the whole system, including the Cas9 and the TET1 but with a catalytically inactive TET1. And that way we'll know whether it's really the modulation of DNA methylation that's important or whether it's just having Cas9 sitting there. So we're doing those experiments uh, now. So thanks. All right, so we'll cut, I'm gonna cut you off there because we we're out of time, Jillian, for your talk. And so we have a few people with various hands we couldn't get to, my apologies. You can post your questions in the Q&A and Julian, um, there's one there now, if you have questions, you post something on Julian, you can go and type out your answers for them. But thank you for the beautiful talk, and I'll pass pass over to Aldous for the next. Okay, thanks everyone for your questions, and Ben. Um,